Hey everyone and welcome back to today's Bible study. We are in the book of Revelation and we are on chapter 11 today. So we finished off chapter 10 where a mighty angel has now placed his feet on the earth and he had a little book and when he cried there were there were seven thunders uttered but God told John not to write down what those thunders were. The angel then said the delay is over for God's wrath and it was about to get really bad. It was if it wasn't already, if you thought that was bad, what's coming is worse. And that at the seventh trumpet would mark the end of the tribulation. John was then instructed by God to go to the angel and take the book. And the angel told John to eat the book. And it was described as being sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his belly. And that's kind of symbolizing that even though the word and prophecy is hard to digest, we still need to be preaching it. And the words are sweet to us who are saved in Christ, but it is hard to know what is coming and what's going to happen to so many people. So we're now in the famous two witnesses. So let's get right into today's work. Hopefully you're ready with your Bible and your beverage of choice. And let's get right into it. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. Alright, so John has given something, kind of like a tape measure in our modern world, to go measure the temple and the altar, and count everyone who worships there. Bit of background knowledge. To measure a structure or piece of property in scripture is a means of laying claim to it. You measure it because you own it. So in this case, God is saying, to go claim the Jewish temple in Jerusalem that's going to be rebuilt during the tribulation. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. So John's told not to include measuring the courtyard outside the temple, because it's going to be given to the Gentiles, the nations, and they're going to be trampling the holy city for 42 months and so that 42 months is the last three and a half years of the tribulation and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth so during the tribulation there will be two witnesses who are going to be granted authority to prophesy for three and a half years as well And they're going to be clothed in sackcloth, so they're going to be humble and somber people. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So they're pictured metaphorically as two olive trees and two lamps or candlesticks. Okay, so according to my commentary, olive trees represents God's people and the candlesticks signify God will provide a spiritual illumination. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So there's going to be divine protection over these two witnesses and fire is going to come out of their mouth. Wow, so these aren't just average Joes. These are kind of extraordinary people. And anyone who hurts them is going to be killed. Wow. These have the power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Wow. So these two witnesses are incredibly anointed, incredibly protected people, and they have authority over heaven, so they can stop rain. Mm, good connection. The, the ability to stop rain harkens back to Elijah and the power of water turning them to blood and strike earth with every plague uh, could be Moses. So I have heard this before that the two witnesses could be Elijah of Moses. That is an interesting um, connection. Mm. Elijah prophesied a drought in 1 Kings and Moses pronounced a series of plagues on Egypt, including water turned into blood in Exodus. 
So that could be a hint as to those being the two witnesses. And that's true, they have also returned to Earth at least once before at the Mount of Transfiguration. Very true. Ooh, great. This commentary is really good on this point. It's made a lot of good connections. It said, Elijah didn't die, also he was raptured, wasn't he? And Moses' body was hidden by God, possibly hinting at the Lord's intention to use both of their bodies on Earth again. Ooh. Okay. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. All right, so the, uh, the old AC, um, Antichrist, the beast that comes out of the pit, will be waging war on the witnesses. And after they've finished their testimony, their prophecy, prophesying, uh, the Antichrist will kill them. But his victory is only temporary, we know this. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. So this is going to be global news when these two witnesses die and they're going to be their bodies are going to be lying in the street the wickedness of the city during the tribulation is highlighted by its reference to sodom and egypt and people are not going to allow the witnesses uh, bodies to be buried and they're going to watch their bodies there for three and a half days and it's also similar they use three and a half because well that's half of seven and also at the tribulation period that they were going to be preaching was three and a half years. So I just find that interesting comparison. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So they're gonna have a, a temporary celebration, these people who've hardened their hearts and they're going to be giving gifts to each other and stuff out of celebration that these two witnesses are dead. It's kind of sad. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. So, after three and a half days of being lying in the street, God brings them back to life. See, he can make something good out of everything bad. So here we you kind of sad like oh why aren't the people letting their body their bodies be buried that's so disrespectful but god allowed that because he wanted to do this and raise them from the dead in front of everyone and if they were buried well that would be very difficult <laughs> so yeah although we might see something and go well why are you allowing that god that's mean <laughs> it's because he has a plan a plan to turn it into good and everyone's going to um poop their pants basically because these people that they've been gloating over being dead for three and a half days are going to come back to life. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them. So after they came back to life, God raptured them basically every, while everyone was watching. So the rapture appears quite a few times in a lot of different forms. And you know, I've been thinking about this, the rapture topic is really kind of in my heart a lot. I, I have a lot of interest around that topic because I can't make up my mind. <laughs> I'm reading a book, I've got a couple of books actually. One is more biased towards pre-trib and one looks at all of the arguments around it. And one of the things that I've read so far that's interesting is that Jesus's return is described in phases and so when we say the day of the Lord people think oh it's just one day but actually it, it's a sequential thing and that there could be a couple of raptures I mean we see this is a rapture it might only be two people but it is a rapture and it is mentioned a couple of times not just in Revelation we've got Matthew and Daniel and it's mentioned numerous times of where this could happen so yeah it is interesting you know maybe we're not meant to know 
Maybe it is meant to remain a mystery, but we are told to watch. That much I do know for sure. So yeah, I just thought that was interesting. That yeah, when people say there are people who say there is no rapture in the Bible as well. Like the the views are so varied, but I definitely see the rapture in the Bible. It's just trying to determine the timing at the moment. So anyway, the two witnesses were killed by the beast. Their bodies were left in the street for three and a half days. Everyone was celebrating and watching the bodies and they didn't want them to be buried so they can gloat. And then God brought them back to life and then raptured them back up to heaven. And the same hour was there a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and the, in the earthquake were slain of men, 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. So while they were being raptured, at that very moment, there was a violent earthquake causing a tenth of Jerusalem to fall to the ground and there were 7,000 people who were died. And it's interesting that the survivors finally, some people are finally getting it into their head and the survivors were absolutely terrified and they gave glory to God. So as he often does, as I said before, he allows these negative events to occur because they always bring him a greater glory. They will bring good. And the second woe is past and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. So we saw in previous chapter that there were three woes, the angel, or the eagle was flying around saying, whoa, 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 there's three woes coming. And so that was the second woe. Um, my commentary is just making a note here that the order of events can be a little bit disorientating here. Okay, it says chapter 11 occurs in the part of Revelation which describes the tribulation without focusing on the people, it focuses on events. And now John has moved back to the the people and he's going back filling in the detail but anyway let's keep going and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign forever and ever okay so we finally have the seventh trump which means it is the end of tribulation now and this angel declared that the kingdoms of this world and now the kingdoms of Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. I would like to highlight that I think. Okay, commentary is noting this sequence depicts events strikingly close to the end of tribulation and the coming of God's kingdom. And this is where his pre-tribulation argument comes through because I said the Tony Evans commentary is very pre-trib rapture and he says uh, the rapture is not synonymous with the second coming. As I said earlier, it could be a, a sequential thing, um, his return. It's not just one day. And this uh, commentary says, the rapture is when Christ will come to the air to receive believers into heaven. He will not come all the way down to earth in the rapture. He will only do that at the second coming when he will become accompanied by the saints. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. So here we're preparing for Jesus's second coming where he's actually going to come down to the earth and the 24 elders who we saw in chapter 4 fall down in worship they're praising God saying he has now begun to reign and they're speaking of the resurrection and this is the the old testament right saints Oh, that's a little bit bias again. I'm a bit reluctant here because he's saying this has to be the Old Testament because the New Testament resurrection was at the rapture, according to my commentary. So I will always put a question mark if it's an opinion. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So the stage of Christ's return is beginning with the 24 elders worshipping him 
and then the temple of God in heaven is opened and we finally see the ark and that's followed by lightning, thunder, earthquake, hail. And the stage is fully set now for Christ's return. So there we go, the two witnesses, what an event. John is told first to measure the temple, but not the courtyard, because that's going to be for the Gentiles. And then God's going to give power to two witnesses for three and a half years of the tribulation. And they will be divinely protected. Anyone who tries to harm them will be killed. And these witnesses are going to have the authority to breathe fire out their mouth to hurt people who try and harm them. They will destroy all their enemies and they will have power to shut heaven so it won't rain. They can turn water into blood and they can smite the earth with plagues as often as they want. So they're going to have incredible power. There are similarities with those gifts to Elijah and Moses in the Old Testament. They could be the two witnesses. But then when they finally finish their testimony, that's when the Antichrist, also known as the Beast by this point, will come out of the bottomless pit, fight them and will kill them temporarily. They will leave their bodies in the street for three and a half days. People are going to be celebrating, giving gifts, and they refuse to allow them to be buried so they can gloat over their dead bodies. But then, after three and a half days, God will breathe life back into them and they will rise from the dead and everyone is going to be absolutely terrified. And then God's going to rapture them up. And at that time of that rapture, there'll be a huge earthquake and then everyone who's left behind is going to be terrified because a tenth of Jerusalem is going to fall, 7,000 people are going to die, and those people are finally going to give glory to God. And that is the second woe. And then the seventh angel blows their trumpet, and this is signifying the return of Christ to come down to earth by this point. The 24 elders are worshipping God, saying, your reign is coming, and that there will be the old saints who are going to be resurrected. The prophets will be rewarded. Anyone that fears thy name, small and great. And then the temple of God is opened in heaven. And we see his ark and there's lightning, voices, thunder, earthquakes, hail. Ready for Christ's return. So there we go. Uh, what's coming next with the beast and everything. I know there's a lot of symbolism here. There's many ways to interpret all this. So we will see. <laughs> we'll see how it goes, what is revealed here. I might look at some other commentaries as well so I can get an overview. But bear in mind, I want to re-emphasize this. Everything I'm sharing, especially within Revelation, a lot of it is interpretation. And no one can know for sure what it means. Like, okay, the other day, I'll use an example. Let's go back a minute. Okay, in chapter 9 where we had an army of the horsemen, right, for the for the four angels released from the Euphrates River. I recently saw a video of someone saying this is a Chinese army coming to attack mankind. I, I literally heard someone say that because of something to do with red, I don't know. I don't know how they were justifying it, but this is how some people are interpreting Revelation. Some people also, with the four horsemen and the, the horses, some people are saying this stuff has already happened and it's over um, thousands of years, and it's not happening in the seven years. So there's so many ways I'm seeing people interpret this. It's very interesting. So we have to be very careful not to take people's comments, even mine, as truth, because they are just interpretations, and I'm getting a lot of mine from commentaries, And but most of the time I'm just saying I don't know. And I think that's part of the beauty of Revelation, is that so much is mysterious, and we have to just trust the Holy Spirit guiding us here. So be careful who we listen to. Don't take anyone's interpretation as truth. Read the word for yourself and see what it says and decide from there. And sometimes it's okay to leave question marks. We don't have to have everything analyzed and determined. That's exactly what this means. It's okay. There are mysteries. There are some things God doesn't want us to know. And that's okay too as long as we keep our trust in him. We are told to read this and we are blessed if we read this as it says in chapter one. We do need to know what's coming and to help prepare people. But as for interpretations, that's exactly what they are. They are just interpretations and opinions. So yes, we have to be very wise um, 
when it comes to reading and studying the book of Revelation in particular. So anyway, I hope that's blessed you today. Thank you for joining me in this study of the two witnesses in chapter 11. We are on chapter 12 next and we've got some signs of Christ's second return as well. Please leave any comments and takeaways you've got in the section below. Subscribe to join us along with the rest of this journey of Revelation. Remember, Jesus loves you very much. God willing, I'll speak to you soon. And until then, have a blessed day. Bye. Bit of cross. Um. <clears throat> <clears throat>